So today we're going to engage modernism. We'll be talking principally about uh, the music of Igor Stravinsky. I should also mention Arnold Schoenberg, just as Verdi and uh, Wagner were the principal composers of opera in the 19th century. So Schoenberg and Stravinsky were the principal proponents not only of instrumental music but some vocal music in the first half of the 20th century. So we want to keep them uh, carefully positioned on our radar screen here. Igor Stravinsky, of course, was a Russian composer born in St. Petersburg. You had the dates up there on the board, I'm sure. Uh, he studied with Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, who wrote one famous piece, Scheherazade, which I used to hear all the time as a kid, uh, and then caught the eye of Sergei Diaghilev. Sergei Diaghilev was an impresario. What's an impresario? Who can tell me what an impresario is? It's a fancy word for Thaddeus. A producer, okay? Think of the Broadway show, The Producers. He's simply um, a producer, and what Diaghilev was producing wa and importing uh, into Paris from Russia was modernist art from Russia. Modernist painting, modernist ballet, modernist art music, and modernist opera. So that's what we want to keep in mind with regard to Sergei Diaghilev. And for Diaghilev, Stravinsky composed early in his career three important ballet scores. And you have those titles up on the board there. Firebird with its date, what, like 1909, uh, Petrushka, 1911, and then uh, The Rite of Spring in 1913. Now, the first of these ballets to really show a heavy modernist content is not so much Firebird, but more the second of this troika here, Petrushka. It's modern because of the new approach to rhythm. In the romantic music that we have been listening to, we would hear these long, somewhat amorphous melodies, amorphous in terms of the uh, rhythm. But now here, with the advent of modernism in the 20th century, we get a much more driving uh, type of rhythm. It almost, in some ways, goes back to the driving rhythms of the Baroque, except with one major difference, and that is that these modern rhythms are highly irregular. What we get oftentimes are irregular meters. What would you imagine an irregular meter is? Anyone want to feel that one? Irregular meters. Well, simply said, it's not a succession of 2-4, 2-4, 2-4, 2-4, or 3-4, 3-4, but 2-4, 5-4, 4-4, 2-4, 6-4, 3-8, and so on. Each measure can have a different meter. In addition, we also have this phenomenon called polymeters, in which you could assign to your clarinet to play in 3-4 and your bassoon to play in 4-4, and maybe your violins in 7-8. So as a result, you get something of a disjunctive uh, rhythmic texture here, disjointed uh, rhythms. And the second, second aspect of this uh, uh, approach to modernism has something to do with the orchestration. There's a great deal more emphasis now on percussive effects. New instruments are added uh, to the orchestra. Instruments called the xylophone, the glockenspiel, the celesta. And if you want to see a picture of some of these, you could open your textbook at some point, just write this in your notes, C figure, I think I wrote it down here, figure 10, no, excuse me, five, number 10, chapter five, number 10. You can see some of these percussion instruments, but basically they're just either sticks or pieces of metal bars that you beat with sticks or in the case of the celesta, you activate with a keyboard. So we've got these two things here, so driving but irregular rhythms, and we also have this new approach to orchestration. So let's listen to a bit now of Igor Stravinsky's ballet of 1911, Petrushka.
Okay, so we'll stop there. Uh, Jacob and I were fooling around with this in the background trying to figure out what these meters were, see if we could pick up these different changes. But they are, as in, had, and how do we do? Not well. Jacob says we did not do well uh, because without the score it's difficult to anticipate which meter is going to come next. And you heard the intense percussive effects there. But Stravinsky's most radical statement of modernism occurs not here in Petrushka but two years later in the Rite of Spring. Uh, it premiered in Paris uh, in uh, May of 1913 and it's become something of a cultural icon, this whole idea of the Rite of Spring. Indeed, uh, I have this book and I've had it for quite a while, Rites of Spring by Madras Eckstein. It's often required reading in the history department here, history programs. Anybody ever run into this, been asked to read anything by Madras Eckstein? Well, uh, the subtitle is here, The Great War and the Birth of the Modern Age, but it's not accidental that he is playing off of this title of a ballet of Igor Stravinsky because the ballet of Stravinsky was a kind of watershed, uh, a touchstone, the benchmark from which modernism uh, can be uh, uh, calculated and against which it can be uh, measured. So when the audience arrived there at the Théâtre Champs-Élysées, Théâtre Champs-Élysées in Paris, and that theater still is there. You can walk down the Avenue Montaigne, it's all where the Hermes is and Gucci and all of these fancy stores, it's there in Paris and go in and still hear concerts there. I've heard concerts in the Théâtre Champs-Élysées so you can still do that today, still functioning as one of the major concert halls in Paris. So in any event, May 1913, the audience arrives. They're there to hear a Russian ballet. What kind of music do they expect to hear? Well, let's listen to what they were expecting to hear. So whose music is this? Tchaikovsky, anybody? Uh, Leah, you know the title of it? Swan Lake. So lots of tutus and pas de deux up there. And, moving around. So this is what they thought Russian ballet was. So they arrive, so they arrive, let's go in and set up the next, uh, take their seats, the lights uh, go down, everybody is properly uh, dressed for uh, uh, this particular occasion and here's the kind of music that they hear. So that's a radically new sound, a radically uh, new approach to modern art. And indeed, once again, if you're asked generally cultural historians to put their finger on the moment that constitutes the beginning of modernism, it would probably be this moment of the performance of the, of the Rite of Spring. How did Stravinsky create these radically new sounds? Well, he did so in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, we've, we've been talking before about this idea of, of uh, irregular meters. Let's see how these play out. The music that you were just listening to, not the pitches, but the durations are up here on the board. And they're all, as you can see, quarter notes, but they are grouped in different sorts of ways, grouped by these accents. So I've asked Jacob, Jacob's up here to grab his viola now. He's going to come over and play this sequence for us following the accents, uh, and then he will be joined by our guest artist. <coughs> Okay, so that's the way it goes. That's all the all the violin or the violist or violinist, all the strings do. Let's do that one more time with our guest artist. We're going to add percussion now. <laughs> ah, what a virtuoso <laughs> duo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so that was one, J uh, Jacob don't go away completely uh, here, uh, one other point. Watch Jacob's hand when he is doing this. This is not the way string players normally play. He's doing something extraordinary here. 
And it tells us, we don't hear the, when you play Tchaikovsky, yadi, 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 but that ain't what he's playing now. Okay, so what's he doing? He's playing all with down bows, everything down bow, and that's, a, that's counterintuitive to string, uh, your normal string teaching. So uh, run back there if you would and set the, the slide projector for us. So we've taken these string instruments, instead of using them as these warm vibrato filled communicators we're t uh, in the string family, we're sort of turning them in now to percussion instruments. That's a very percussive effect. So not only do we have new percussion instruments, we have percussive effects with the existing uh, instruments. Uh, and uh, perhaps most important here is the chord, the music that Stravinsky is setting forth here. It's an odd, co odd chord, it's an odd occurrence. What he's got here is a perfectly uh, innocuous E major triad. I'll put it down here an octave. And then on top of it, he's got a seventh chord, uh, starting on E flat. And either, each of those, each by itself is, is rather consonant, but you put the two of them together. So this is a good example of another way that modernism in music is created, and that's through the use of, very obviously, a polychord. Interesting point. I'm going to go to some slides now because it's exactly at this time in the history of art that painters started doing this same kind of thing. So we're going to go to the first slide here. Who painted this, please? Nice, nice and loud. I hear it in the back. Picasso. Okay, three musicians by Pablo Picasso. Uh, and what we have here is sort of one musician kind of out of phase uh, with himself. Uh, one musician and then another musician slightly in an irregular position against it. Next type of slide here, this is uh, Georges Braque, a uh, woman with violin. Uh, a little bit difficult to see the, um, the woman there, but in the context of this highly fragmented violin. Now we're going to go on to one Grise uh, violin. And now we're going to go on to a slide taken from a book published in 1916 by uh, Albert Gleese. Uh, can you focus that just a little bit for us, Jacob? There's a focus knob up there. Uh, go the other way with it. Oh well. But we can see the, we can see the point here. Um, off to the left we have just a square, and that square then is being rotated against itself. It's being rotated itself against itself in another position, rotated itself in an yet another position. And that's all these musicians are doing. They're taking one triad and then taking the triad right next to each other. So the triads are slightly out of phase with each other, and ultimately it produces a rather dissonant uh, configuration. Okay, that's all we, that's all we need here uh, by way of the, of the slides. Well, the pre premiere of the Rite of Spring uh, was just as dissonant as some of these paintings are. Indeed, it, it caused a scandal. It caused a riot. It, was, it created the most uh, infamous, I guess, riot in the history of music. And uh, we have, uh, fortunately, and they are contained here in Madras Eckstein's book, among other places, some primary source accounts, people that were there at the time telling what it was like to be at this premiere. So here are a couple of uh, direct quotes. Then ensued a battery of screams countered by a foil of applause. We warred over art. Mm, I like that, warred over art. Or what some thought was art, but others didn't. About 40 of the protesters were forced out of the theater by the police, but that did not quell the disturbance. The lights in the auditorium were turned fully on, but that did not still the disjointed ravings of a mob of angry men and women." Uh, end quote. And here's another uh, direct quote. I was sitting in a box in which I had rented one seat. Three ladies sat in front of me and a young man occupied the place behind me. He stood up during the course of the ballet to see more clearly. The intense excitement under which he was laboring, thanks to the potent force of the music, portrayed itself presently when he began to beat rhythmically with his fists on the top of my head. 
<laughs> End quote. <laughs> well, what is it again specifically in this music of Stravinsky that causes this kind of reaction? Let me uh, list for you, let me enumerate five things here. One, heavy dissonance. We just heard some of that, <laughs> that kind of sound, almost a cluster type dissonance. Heavy dissonance created by polychords in which we have triads and these triads are only a half step apart. The roots are only a half step apart. So one, heavy dissonance. Two, much greater reliance on percussion, timpani, glockenspiel, celesta, that sort of thing. Three, as we saw with Jacob, the use of stringed instruments as percussion instruments. So a new use of these uh, traditional instruments. And even the piano, this banging on the piano, the percussion, uh, the piano is technically a percussion instrument, but it's a particularly lyrical one. Well, it's not so lyrically used here in the modern idiom. Number four, uh, an increased use of woodwinds. The strings fall into the background, the woodwinds with their potentially bright, brittle sound are now foregrounded. And fifth, uh, this idea of rhythm, driving rhythms, yes, but irregular rhythms and poly, uh, poly meters and uh, irregular meters all creating this kind of disjunctive uh, effect. So let's listen now where, uh, to a passage out of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. You heard one of them. Let's listen to another one in which all five of these elements uh, sound at once. Whoops. We have, track, we have track five. Oh, okay. At 50? Oh, all right. Let's, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead then. What do you think? Do you like that music? Brian, you've been a good student here. You've showed up virtually every lecture. I see you out there. What do you think of this? Is this it's different? More fast paced, more sort of upbeat, kind of like a slap in the face. Uh, who doesn't like it? Uh, end of, okay, Caroline, Caroline, honest person out there, she doesn't like it. At the end of the day, are you going to go home when it's time to relax and put on this music? Probably not. Uh, do I like this music? Yeah, I really do like this music. Um, I love this music, but I've heard it a lot. Uh, and when I first heard it, I didn't like it. It's sort of one of these things like sort of oral spinach or whatever. You've got to really get used to it over, over the years, mushrooms or whatever it might happen to be. I first heard this piece in 1967 when I was a TA. I had to teach it and I didn't really know it. Uh, and then I had the honor and pleasure of hearing it performed live in Paris in 1970. Uh, and it was really an epiphany because I was sitting there, I remember it distinctly, it was in a boxing arena of all places, but they had an elevated stage and the dancers came out and they started going boom, 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 that kind of thing. And the whole arena began to shake and said, whoa, I now understand, I get it. It's not just the music. Music is just part of this total artistic experience. It's a kind of sympathetic vibration uh, in conjunction with the kinetic experience of the dance that really brings all of this to life. So music here is just a kind of catalyst for the ballet and to really begin to appreciate uh, something such as this, Stravinsky's approach to modernism, We've kind of, uh, we do in fact have to see it to, to experience it fully. And that's really what we're going to do here next. We're going to do that in sections starting today. We have a wonderful video for you of the reconstruction of the Rite of Spring because the initial choreography uh, which is an important part of this, was lost. So um, a woman, a choreographer came along, Millicent Hodson, and she reconstructed all the choreography for this dance and then they filmed it. So this is a wonderful opportunity to see this. We'll be talking about this in a uh, section starting today. Okay. We're finished with our brief introduction to modernism and uh, where do we stand now in our course? Uh, well, obviously we're pretty much uh, at the end of it. Uh, what do you have to do? What remains for you to do? 
Zach, what do you got to do? You got to do your last paper. Each TA will assign that last paper. What else do you have to do? Prepare for the final exam. We will be sending you a prep sheet. The final exam, I believe, is Wednesday the 17th at 2 p.m. It will be in this room. Other things? Yeah, the last six listening exercises. And I think that's about it. And of course, in addition, there's a review section uh, that I and, and one or two of the TAs will be doing a week from today, right back, right back in here. So, uh, is that the end of today? No, that's not the end of today. We have uh, a good half hour left, and I'd like to work just with one piece um, and, and one composer. Uh, at the end of the course, I like to do a, a piece that's really, uh, that I love. It doesn't really teach you much of anything. It's, it's an odd sensation. Oftentimes, there are really lovely pieces that I would like to incorporate in the textbook and in this program generally, but I can't do it because they don't really teach us anything. We were listening to one in section, just intro music the other day, uh, by Samuel Barber. Anybody know who wrote a famous piece, or what the name of that famous piece by Samuel Barber is? Thaddeus Elizabeth Raoul? Raoul. The Adagio for, of, for Strings by Samuel Barber. American Samuel, it's beautiful. We should, everybody should download it for 99 cents. It's just gorgeous. But it, we, we don't really learn anything from it. Well, this is a piece that, we, that we're about to hear that we will learn only one, really one thing about, and that is the idea of an orchestral lead. So I'm going to go back to one of my favorite composers, and that is Gustav Mahler. We talked a little bit about Gustav Mahler uh, when we had our uh, lecture on the symphony in the 19th century. And we said that Mahler was of Jewish descent from what is now a portion of the Czech Republic who came into Vienna to study music. He started as a pianist, became a conductor, and basically he earned his living as a conductor. He got small-time jobs out in the provinces and then ultimately worked his way back to Vienna where he became the conductor of the Staatsoper in Vienna. And if you ever go to Vienna, and you should all go to Vienna, it's an incredibly musical city. Everywhere you go, you see these silhouettes of Mozart. It is so cool. So you have to go, you have to, go to, I mean, you can't walk a block without seeing Mozart. It's, it's to die for. Um, so there we are on the Ringstrasse with the great Staatsoper, and this is where Gustav Mahler conducted. It's still there. Um, but Mahler was a difficult person to get along with. I suppose oftentimes great artists are, geniuses are. They tend to be self-referential, and maybe rightly so. Uh, but in any event, he was an orchestral tyrant. His players didn't like playing for them, and after 10 years, they didn't renew his contract. In effect, he was fired in Vienna. But as good fortune had it, he um, uh, was able, or at that time there was an opening in New York City. So he comes to New York to conduct first the Metropolitan Opera, and then a year or so later he took on what was to become the New York Philharmonic. So there he is, the principal conductor now in New York City. Interestingly enough, uh, on two occasions, on two occasions, Mahler um, came to New Haven. He came to New Haven. He brought. Uh, first was in 1910, he brought the New York Philharmonic to New Haven. And where, where did they perform? Where would you imagine they performed? Woolsey Hall, okay? Woolsey Hall. Woolsey Hall was built for Gustav Mahler. No, that's not really true but it gets across a point that Woolsey Hall was built to be a concert hall for what Gustav Mahler represented, which was the apotheosis, the ultimate flourishing, although they didn't know it was the ultimate at the time, of this great instrument, which was the 19th century orchestra. So Mahler brings the New York Philharmonic to Woolsey Hall. Next time you're in Woolsey Hall, think of Gustav Mahler standing on those boards there. And as good luck would have it again, it was reviewed in, of all places, as you can see by the handout for today, ta -da, the Yale Daily. Okay? How about that? The Yale Daily <laughs> reviews Gustav Mahler. Astonishing. Okay. Astonishing. Um, and I didn't, darn it, I didn't bring my glasses today, but you can sort of look at the, look at the review there. 
uh, and it talks about the repertoire. What, uh, what, did he, what did he perform? First of all, they slightly misspelled his name. There's no E on Gustav in the way he spelled it, but that doesn't really matter. Um, what did they perform at this concert conducted by Mahler in Wolsey Hall? What's it say there, Elizabeth? Okay, Symphonie Fantastique, the basis of what? Your listening exercise 34, okay? So that was one of the big pieces, ones that you have just engaged. What else, please? Bach suite. Okay, Bach orchestral suite doesn't say which one, doesn't matter. What else? And Strauss's Yeah, that's good. Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks. That's another one of these tone poems, like Zarathustra and like Death and Transfiguration <laughs> by Strauss. And there was also um, a, a pianist there. And what did she perform? O Olga Samarov? Yeah, uh, the Greek piano concerto. But no music by Mahler, because in his uh, day, uh, Mahler was thought to really be more of a conductor, uh, conductor than he was a uh, composer. We'll come back to that point in a minute. The second time that Mahler came to New Haven was the next year, 1911. He went to what was then called New Haven Hospital. Why? Because he had a heart condition. Uh, and I gather, uh, and we have in our midst today a specialist who can talk to this more directly than I, um, a streptococcal infection, a lingering streptococcal infection in the area of the heart uh, that had greatly weakened his heart. Uh, so the doctors at, at Yale New Haven Hospital, New Haven Hospital said, really nothing we can do for you. He goes back to New York, goes immediately back to Vienna, and he dies within six weeks of this uh, heart uh, condition. And we have, and I'm delighted to say Dr. James, James Hines has been with us all semester. Jim, thank you for your attendance, uh, a cardiologist. He has been here. You may have thought that this was just accidental, but in case I was thinking this morning, uh, we would never told you that we had, if your heart begins to palpitate when you're listening to all this really great music, and you become a phasic or something like that, we have an attendant here ready to serve you in the form of Dr. Hines. So you've been in good hands all along. And thank you, Jim, for, for being here. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at some of the things that Gustav Mahler composed here. And I think we've got a list up on the board. Okay. Uh, symphonies, nine symphonies. Why is it everybody composes nine symphonies and then they die? Uh, I stop at eight. No. Uh, comp he composed also nine symphonies. He composed nine symphonies. Um, and if you like Mahler, and I hope you will come to like Mahler, uh, I think there's an entry path into these symphonies. Start with number four. It's the most user friendly. Then number one. We played uh, extracts out of number one uh, in that symphony lecture, so you know that's, uh, it's a great piece too. Then uh, symphony number five, which is worth the price of admission, really, uh, if for no other reason than the middle movement there, that adagietto, is just so heartbreakingly beautiful that no one would want to miss it. And then ultimately, a little bit more challenging symphonies, bigger symphonies, uh, number eight and number nine. Mahler also wrote, as you can see up there, two collections of songs. They're called orchestral leader. We have this term orchestral lit, simply means orchestral song. Uh, we've had the lit before in our course. Uh, where? Indeed, what was the name of the lit that we worked with? Well, composer's name, the name of the piece. Hmm? Okay, well, that's it, that's it. What was the name of the piece? <coughs> Elf King, thank you, Frederick. And who was the composer? Franz Schubert. Okay, so we've had a, that's, that's a lead for piano, but now we have a lead for voice and orchestra. So it tends to be bigger and more flamboyant. This is a new genre, it's longer, it's more colorful, yet it features a single voice singing a, uh, a, single, a single text. So we're going to focus on now on one of, of uh, Gustav Mahler's orchestral uh, leads. Um, and it's talked about in the textbook there uh, right before Impressionism. Uh, no listening exercise on it. And as I say, it's in there just because I think it's a drop-dead beautiful piece. 
and I want to, to try to proselytize a bit with regard to Mahler's music. So it has a text. Here's the text. The text is by romantic uh, German poet Friedrich Rückert. We're now talking about uh, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen by Friedrich Rücker as set in this collection of five songs about 1902. 1902. Um, and let's take a look at the German here just for a moment. Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. I've become detached from the world. Um, and uh, I thought it might be nice to hear um, a German speaker or somebody that speaks pretty good German uh, tackle this text. So I've asked a student, David Norotsky, to stand up, if you would. Um, and, uh, David's applying to med school, right? You're going around with all kinds of med school interviews, but here he's putting on his German hat for us uh, this morning. So read the first uh, strophe, please, David. Okay, and let's cut to the last one, and a little bit more slowly, and a little because it slows down. So let's let's read it a little more slowly. Ich bin gestorben, der Welt sich tümmelt, und wo in einem stillen Gebiet, ich lebe allein in meinem Himmel, in meinem Leben, in meinem Lied. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So as you can see here, uh, this is in a sense old person's music, in that this is an individual that has become. Uh, uh, disenchanted is exhausted from uh, the trials and tribulations of this of this world, as it says, "Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen." I've become detached from the world, and if you don't see much of me anymore, I don't really care because, as it says uh, in the last strophe, "Ich bin gestorben der Welt getrümmel." I'm dead to the tumult, I guess, of, of the world. In who in a stillen Gebiet, and I rest now in a still land. Uh, ich lebe allein. I'm living alone in my heaven, in meine Lieben, in meinen Lied. And there, we, it's an interesting play of the word Lied because it's not so much a song. This is a metaphor for all of his music. So this is an individual that has become detached from the world uh, and simply wants to live in the world of music. So let's listen to a bit of it now. Um, and it starts out uh, with an English horn. Somebody tell us, review for us, what an English horn is. Talked about this before, Jerry? A, a lower oboe, that's right, a lower oboe. And it sounds a little bit mournful, sounds a little bit nostalgic here. So we hear lovely harp underneath, and then the English horn will start with just one phrase and then that phrase will grow. It's kind of a cell or a mode of growing into a longer melody as we discussed at the beginning of the course. Whoops. Uh, we need, let's see, track two? It's okay. Of the, of, of the red CD? Oops. No, no, let's see, it should be, have been the single CD that was in here. Uh, it should be CD5. Is sure it's not in there? Uh, this is track two of what you gave me. It should be CD3. Okay. Sorry. That's, it's that red one there. Yeah. So we, how many CDs do we have? It's doing the thing where it won't change all the way. Okay. Um, shut, shut it down then and, we'll, and, and then see if we can get it back to that CD and it should be track two of that, that CD. Sometimes our CD player eats our CDs. It gets, gets it up there and it won't release them, so we'll have to reconfigure this. Um, it's an interesting uh, song in that I'm going to vamp here just for a moment. We've, it starts out with, with the harp underneath and the English horn and it's a movement in which there is no brass whatsoever. So I believe we have it set up now. It's not to be an exciting movement, a much more of a reflective movement.
passes off the melody to a clarinet. And then the voice will come in. Pause it there. Um, then we will go on to a little bit of material from the climax of the song, just by way of a preview here. We're going to go on now to uh, 447, if you, if you will, uh, where he works up to a peak on this text. Ich lebe in meinen Himmel, in meinen Lieben, in meinen Lied. bit of dissonance. Back to the tonic. English horn comes back in, builds out the melody. We're going to pause it here because there's one other small point that I want to make, and that has to do with a, what's called a suspension. The suspension is something that composers set up in music to sort of make us feel a particular way. And they'll start with this by having a note be consonant and then having, moving the harmony underneath of it to a dissonance and then resolving it to a consonant like that. Or maybe and the longer they sit on the dissonance, the more feeling, I think, is, is communicated. And here at the end of the Romantic period, it tends to be, they tend to sit on these dissonances inside of the suspension for a long period of time. So we're about to hear, we still got it right there, we're about to hear the strings go up and play a suspension and then the English horn will do the same. There it is. Now the English horn will suspend. Dissonance. Okay, so that's the piece. Now we're going to do something we've only done one other occasion in the, our class, and that is to list the whole piece from beginning to end. I'd like to do this. I'm even a little hokey, I guess, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to turn off all the lights here as best I can. And I do this because it gives you a sense sometimes of what, at least how I engage music oftentimes, what does it do for us? Well, we've talked before at the beginning, it allows us to kind of relax, center our attention. You're under a lot of stress at the moment. This is uh, the sort of climax, crunch time in the academic world. So this is an opportunity to kind of tune everything out, maybe go inside of your own gebiet here, your own musical territory. Uh, and maybe think of things in the past, music as a creator of nostalgia, think of things that might be, music uh, 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 giving us a vision perhaps of a better world. Uh, whatever you'd like, to, whatever spin you want to put on this, but we're going to, each of us is now going to go into our own zone here for about seven minutes as we listen to this orchestral lead, Ich bin der Welt an Hang gekommen by Gustav Mahler.
Okay, so that's our last piece of music for listening to music here. Now I'm going to tell you what this class was really about. <laughs> it wasn't about listening to music. It was about saving classical music. Saving classical music. Why? Why would we want to save classical music? We could spend hours discussing that. Uh, we would want to save it, arguably, because it is one of the things that we value in Western culture. What do we value? I was thinking about this this morning. We, got, we just had a big election, right? We value democracy. We value religious freedom. We value uh, quality of the sexes, of gender. What else? Uh, due process under the law. We value Shakespeare. We value Leonardo da Vinci and the symphonies of, of Mozart, for example. Uh, and these are very important things. I think they're worth, worth fighting for and worth trying to, trying to preserve. Recently, somebody gave the School of Music how much money? $100 million to keep classical music alive. That's a lot of money. I've done my part, showed up here every day, haven't missed a minute. Now it's time for you to do your part. What's your part? You have to do the following kinds of things. You have to continue to buy CDs and download classical music uh, off of iTunes or whatever it is. Don't steal that stuff. Why? If you take that stuff for nothing, what are you doing? You're taking the livelihood away from Jacob and Santana and uh, Linda here. They're, it's the livelihood of musicians. They've put their labor into it and you're taking it for nothing. So download these things. It doesn't cost all, all that much. Two, get involved. Get involved in informal singing groups. Keep your piano lessons. If you ever had those kinds of things going on, local choral groups, whatever. You get out of Yale, what do you do? Get on the boards of these artistic institutions. Your local symphony, your local choral society, opera company, neighborhood music school here. Get on the board of that and help them. Those sorts of folks. Most important, give music lessons to your children, adopted or, or natural. Why? Teaches them hard work, teaches them to think sequentially, teaches them various forms of quantitative reasoning, teaches them also uh, to be disciplined and teaches them to uh, have a, a pride in the work product that, that they, that they uh, ultimately, ultimately generate. So these are the kinds of things that, that you can do. I thank you for your attention. I thank you, I thank the TAs for doing such a wonderful, we've had great TAs this year. And uh, to, I will end by quoting, thanking you for, for allowing me to quote here uh, Gustav Mahler once again to share with you meine Lieben und meine Lied, because it really is. Thanks very much.